So, good evening, 5 p.m. Obviously, you know my name is Greg from these guys over here. This is my second sermon ever, as they were alluding to. My first sermon was a few weeks ago with my beautiful wife, Inga. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, it was amazing, and I had her next to me to help me and encourage me and make up for all my shortcomings. So, she's not here tonight, so please pray this goes well. Okay. <laughs> So it's a crazy time we live in, described as a postmodern world where truth is apparently subjective. But those of us who are rooted in Christ, we know that truth is absolute. There is only one truth, Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life. And the way we learn about this truth is through his word in the Bible. If you're new here or you just haven't been paying attention, we're tracking through Mark this year, yeah? <laughs> It's been a while since we've been in Mark, so just to recap, last time on City Hope Church, James over here was preaching through Mark uh, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45, and he acknowledged a huge problem in society, love of self. But he showed us how Jesus breaks this mirror of narcissism, that he shatters this mirror. And we heard how the disciples, James and John, were arguing, trying to sit at Jesus' left and right hand, looking for earthly prestige and honor, missing the true identity of Jesus and what he came to accomplish. In Mark 10, 45, we read, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' identity, the humble servant. Jesus had been trying to prepare his disciples for his costly ministry. He had already told them a few times that he was going to Jerusalem where he would be scourged and mocked and crucified. But the disciples are missing this. They don't seem to be catching it. And this made me think, what could we be missing? Do we miss the true identity of Jesus? This evening, we'll be looking at the triumphant entry. And just for context, Mark 11 begins the last week of Jesus' life before the cross. This is a major shift in the gospel. It precedes various confrontations with religious leaders, all leading to Jesus' crucifixion. In the previous chapter, just before this chapter, we read how Jesus was leaving Jericho, and he met up with a blind man named Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus was shouting out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus heals his sight, and Bartimaeus follows along with him on the road when he travels towards Jerusalem, his final destination. This triumphal entry is mentioned in all four gospel accounts. So no matter what portrait of Jesus the writers are trying to paint here, this narrative is vital to all of them. I've given my sermon the title tonight, The Unexpected Messiah, and with the help of Duncan, I've divided it into three separate headings or sections. The first one being prophecies of the Messiah, verses 1 to 6, presentation of the Messiah, verses 7 to 10, and the providence of the Messiah in verse 11. Yeah, it was Duncan, so of course it's good. Yeah, it wasn't me. Yeah. So this, this notion of Messiah, you can hear from the titles, it's quite important to the text. It's, in its most basic terms, the Messiah is just the promised and expected deliverer of God's people. Now, God's people were Abraham's offspring. So the Messiah came to be seen as the Hebrew Messiah. And any references to the Old Testament promises of this deliverer are described as messianic. The gospel writers are very intentional here about including these Old Testament prophecies, patterns, and promises. Clues indicating that Jesus is this Messiah. But the Israel people had developed a very narrow view of the Messiah, thinking he was a national deliverer or a warrior like David. They did not realize the universal scope of the Old Testament prophecies and expectations. Jesus is the Messiah, but not only the Hebrew Messiah. He's the deliverer of the entire world, Amen. granting liberation through his death and resurrection. So the Old Testament is full of subtle and overt prophecies, all pointing to Jesus. And this triumphant entry, many of these are fulfilled. So as we read through and expand on the text, keep the Old Testament in mind. And I want you to ask yourself these questions. Do you worship the true Jesus? Have you missed his true identity? Are there things in your life that you expect God to do? 
to deliver you from before you surrender fully? Does your praise fade or disappear when life goes off track? So if you have your physical Bibles or phone app things, you can open up Mark 11. We're reading from verse 1 to 11. Should be on screen behind me. I'll trust and not even check. So now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hoshana, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hoshana in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So, In the first verse, Mark is setting the scene, and we might not see this from a casual read, but the setting has huge symbolic significance, especially if we take into account the Old Testament. If you look at the map on screen behind me, you'll just get an image, an idea, a picture of what's going on here. We'll see at the bottom right-hand side, Bethany, and that's where Jesus stayed during Passion Week. He stayed with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, and those guys. And the road he took up past Bethphage into the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives sits directly east of Jerusalem. And this mountain looks over into Jerusalem and the temple. And then you can see that pathway that would have taken down through the valley up and into Jerusalem towards the temple. So the Mount of Olives was already known as a place of worship before David's time. We can see this in 2 Samuel and Ezekiel 11. But... In verse 11 of Mark here, when Jesus arrives at the temple, and with the cleansing of the temple in verses 15 to 19, we can see that the Mount of Olives also points to prophecies in Zechariah 14 and Ezekiel 43. So in this point in history, the Mount of Olives was established as a place with great messianic significance. So in the first verse, with few words, Mark sets the stage for the true messianic king, part of Jesus' true identity. But Jesus' sovereign rule is unexpected and incomparable to any earthly ruler. Jesus then directs two disciples to a village where they will find a donkey tied. Jesus perfectly describes events as they were to occur. Whether Jesus knew these things or he sovereignly planned for these to happen, it amounts to the same thing. It shows that Jesus has the sovereign authority of a king that he was purposeful, preparing for a public display, which is quite different from his previous more low-key actions he's done up until now. In Mark, we don't get any direct mention of the prophecy from Zechariah, but in John and Matthew's account, they state how this is directly fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, which reads, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So a colt is just a young donkey, four years or younger. A foal is just an even younger donkey. But in verse 2, we read that the donkey has never been ridden, on which no one has ever sat. This has huge messianic and kingly symbolism. An unbroken or unridden beast of burden or donkey signifies consecration, dedication to a sacred, holy, godly purpose furthering all this royal imagery. When we read that the donkey was bound or tied, this points even further back to a prophecy prophecy in Genesis 49. So throughout the Bible, we see powerful images and prophecies all pointing to Jesus as the promised savior. The Genesis prophecy speaks of a king coming on a donkey and mentions a fruitful vine, symbolizing abundance and blessing. Zechariah describes a humble king riding a donkey into Jerusalem. 
Jesus fulfills these prophecies. He enters into Jerusalem on a donkey, showing he is the true peaceful king promised long ago. Mm. Later in John 15, Jesus calls himself the true vine, teaching that he is the source, and true, the source of true life and connection to God. All these connections show how the Old Testament promises come together in Jesus, revealing Jesus as the Messiah, part of his true identity. Now, we need to model our life on Jesus. When it comes to planning, I need this more than anyone else. But we need to follow Jesus, emulating the way he lived, being deliberate like Jesus was with this entry into Jerusalem. If you follow Jesus, you must know what you are aiming for. Plan purpose-driven actions to emulate Christ with total reliance on the Father and the Holy Spirit in everything you do. But be like Christ by setting clear intentions and preparing thoroughly, acting with purpose to achieve meaningful outcomes. On Tuesday evening this week, I got back from a huge work project in Botswana. It was a very difficult project. It was something new, something I'd never done before, and I was quite nervous about this. I prayed long and hard before I left, and I asked many people to pray for me while I was there. But I didn't just pray and then sit back and expect the project to magically complete itself. I spent hours and hours researching and planning. God gave me strength and perseverance in the preparations, and he gave me peace in the midst of difficult circumstances. Being away from my wife for two and a half weeks, the longest I've been away from her since we've been married, that was hard. But God helped me through this, and I couldn't have completed this project without him. But I still had to put in effort. When I play on band, I pray and ask God to work in my heart, to move me to worship in truth and honesty, to prepare my heart by the power of the Holy Spirit to ensure I'm beholding His glory throughout. But I still spend hours and hours practicing. On Thursday night this week, I was up until 3 a.m., Nice 10-hour practice surgeon, uh, session for youth on Friday night. So I've got the, the preparation, but maybe if I plan better, I could get a decent night's sleep. But I, I have to put careful time and effort into this to ensure that I can play with my heart full and directed towards God. I don't want to worry about playing the right notes or doing something wrong. This is what I want to concentrate on. So I still spend hours and hours practicing choosing the right effects, the right notes, the right tone for each song. Relying on God doesn't mean we don't put in effort. It doesn't mean we don't plan carefully, but it does mean we have comfort and support and strength throughout. We have the word of the creator to guide us, the word to show us how Jesus loved and how he lived more likely, but how he loved as well is also good. But the better we understand the Old Testament, the more this word comes alive and we see all the symbolic significance here. This event, the beginning of Passion Week, Jesus' last week on earth, shows us how intentional Jesus is. He knew exactly what was coming. He had his eyes set on the cross. He was a knowing participant, not a passive figure. And this leads us to see how Jesus deliberately chose to present himself and how the people saw him. With all the preparations complete, Jesus begins his entry into Jerusalem. This takes us to my second heading, presentation of the Messiah. The disciples had gone out and retrieved the donkey just like Jesus told them to. In verse 7 we read, And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. So the crowd honors Jesus here by spreading their cloaks and the branches on the road. In 2 Kings, the same action was done to honor Jehu when he was named king. This is all emphasizing Jesus' kingly role and how the crowd wished to honor him as king. In 2 Kings, Elisha, the prophet, anoints Jehu king. This was a godly appointment, not decided by men. And Jesus, God incarnate, God in the flesh, fully human yet fully God, this kingly appointment of Jesus is obviously from the heavenly Father. But it's not an earthly role. The way Jesus rules is very different to any earthly king. It's not through military strength or physical intimidation or even 
popular appointment. Jesus rules by suffering and dying on a cross for our sins. Jesus' identity is rooted in his sacrificial love. His conquest is not physical and temporal, but spiritual and eternal. Over death and sin, he wasn't here to overthrow a political regime, and the the people missed this. Throughout Mark, we see how even the disciples have been confused, not understanding Jesus' purpose here. Do you get it? Do you see the true significance of Jesus, his true identity? The king to rule all kings, not an earthly temporary king, the all-powerful eternal king of the entire cosmos. But the way Jesus displays his authority is very different to what we would expect. When I was thinking on this triumphal entry, uh, it made me think of the Disney movie, Aladdin, the magic carpet guy. And I was thinking through this, yeah, <laughs> when, when Aladdin is trying to impress Jasmine with his entry into the city, the genie grants his every wish, and he arrives in a grand parade, yeah. There's elephants, exotic animals, dancers, musicians, all designed to impress and signify wealth and status. But this is not who Aladdin is. He was a peasant stealing apples to survive. Now Jesus, more powerful than any imaginary genie, enters Jerusalem on a donkey. He flips the image we have of power and prestige here, the humble servant. Even when being acknowledged and shown adoration, it's done in a comparatively subtle way. The donkey symbolizes Jesus' role, Jesus' role as a peaceful king. And this event is a humble declaration of his spiritual kingship. Aladdin was not a king, not even a prince. He had no authority. He was faking it with this spectacular display. Jesus, king of the universe, creator and sustainer, with authority over everything. In the next three verses, he curses a fig tree and it never grows fruit again. Authority over everything. He humbly enters in a downscale procession. Although he had all the power, he chose humility. He chose obedience. Jesus chose to be the suffering servant, not an authoritative king. And he wasn't a thief like Aladdin. He lived the perfect life without sin. The only thing he stole was the punishment we deserved. (laughs) In the previous section of Mark 10 verses 42, Jesus says, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Jesus doesn't force his will. He doesn't lord it over us. He doesn't show off or boast like most people do when they get a little bit of power. He is humble. We can't even define humility without pointing to Jesus. The ultimate example of humility, God humbling himself to be like man, to take the punishment of death we deserved for sin. This is part of Jesus' true identity. Imagine if we could humble ourselves like this. Would you take the punishment for someone else's crime? Jesus didn't just save us from sin. He also showed us what it means to be truly human as God created us in right relationship with God, in total obedience and dependence on the Father. Despite all this humbleness of the entry, Jesus did get some praises. The crowd were shouting, Hoshana! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hoshana in the highest. In church, I've heard us sing Hosanna before. I'm not going to sing for you. I'll stick to guitar and leave that to the experts. Yeah, you don't want to hear that, yeah. But we, we, we sing with smiles and this joyous, pretty kind of choir thing. Hosanna, Hosanna. And when James helped me with the pronunciation here, Hoshana, that's why I've been saying it weird the whole time. That's how it's pronounced. I really started to see what this word actually meant. I thought before from the context that Hosanna was like a super profound hallelujah, that it's something like awesome Jesus deep people do just to be super cool. They say Hosanna while we say hallelujah. But the word Hoshana, it means save, we pray. When linguistic experts try to get a sense of this word, they define it as liberate us now. It comes from the root Hebrew words, yasha, a verb meaning to deliver or brought salvation, 
and the suffix na, which expresses intense emotion. This was a plea, a desperate cry for help. The crowd were begging for salvation from the current Roman oppression. They missed it. The disciples missed it. They all wanted to see Israel restored to its former glory of David and Solomon times. They didn't get it, the true reason for Jesus' arrival, the true identity of Christ. In earlier chapters, we saw how the disciples fought over who would be on the right and left and who would be first among them, looking for status and honor in an earthly kingdom they expected. Yet the crowd's cries here, even if they weren't aware of it, really spoke to the eternal salvation wrought by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. This cry, Hoshana, a plea for salvation, reflects Psalm 118, specifically verse 25 where it says, say we pray, but read from 19 down, it's really good, it points to Jesus like directly. So for homework today, guys, go read Psalm 118. <laughs> I'll be asking questions on Monday. Yeah, tomorrow. tomorrow. Oh yeah, that's tomorrow. Yeah. So the cries for the kingdom of our father David showed that the crowd had these messianic hopes though their understanding of Jesus' mission may have been confused. If we remember in the previous section, where Bartimaeus was calling Jesus son of David, we can ask if maybe the crowd was doing the same thing here. But unlike Bartimaeus, their blindness remained. They didn't see the true identity of Jesus. This all emphasizes the misunderstanding they had of the Messiah. Jesus didn't come to overthrow Rome, or establish an earthly kingdom. He came to overthrow death and sin, to bring about the heavenly kingdom of God. The crowd, even the disciples, those closest to Jesus, did not yet fully grasp what the Messiah was sent to do. We often make fun of the disciples. They lived with Jesus for three years. How could they not get it? But it was only in Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that all these things were fully revealed. And we have this, yet we still miss it. We can get so caught up in our lives, our struggles, looking for our liberation from whatever earthly oppression we think we're suffering from. Do we get who Jesus is? Have we missed the true Jesus? We see. Do we see? that he is God in the flesh, God working throughout history to rescue us for his glory. The true and living God, creator of the universe, entered history and made a way for us to be reconciled to him. Do we see this Jesus? Do we understand his true identity? Not just a moral teacher, not a political figure, not a character in a story, but the most significant figure in all of history. Do we recognize this Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel? We have less of an excuse than the disciples. We have the full revelation from God in the Bible. We have the cross. We have the resurrected Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We need to look to Jesus, to the cross, align our lives with his will. And we'll see how Jesus rode into Jerusalem humbly on a donkey we see how Jesus contrasts the grandeur typically associated with kings. If you call yourself a Christian, a follower of Jesus, you must copy his leadership style, rooted in humility and servanthood, prioritizing the needs of the lowest over personal power and prestige. The misunderstanding of the crowd, expecting a political savior, this illustrates the need to seek deeper understanding of faith and the true nature of salvation. They use scripture to identify the Savior, the Messiah, but their thinking was wrong. It was too small. They missed the universal application. What are we missing? You can't merely read the Bible passively or just listen to sermons on occasion. You need to engage and develop your personal relationship with Jesus. Reading the Bible intentionally prayerfully, often, regularly, consistently. Get the point, yeah. <laughs> Just read the Bible, guys. It's got some good stuff in there. It's got Jesus, yeah. But we need to seek deeper understanding through conversations with other Christians by signing up for Institute. You need to pray and beg, 
ask the Holy Spirit to put to death your way of thinking, transforming your thoughts to align with His. And this will all lead to a more authentic faith that transcends mere ritual or tradition with a focus on spiritual growth and transformation, actively living out what is taught in Scripture. We need to look deeper to ensure we don't miss who Jesus says he is. In the final verse of the triumphal entry, we see the providence of the Messiah. With the public entry completed, Jesus heads towards the temple, the religious epicenter of the Jewish nation. In verse 11, we read, and he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So in verse 10, the crowds are shouting praises in this glorious parade. Jesus enters Jerusalem, fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah. The political and religious leaders are out to murder Jesus. The tension here is intense. He goes straight to the temple, the most significant spiritual place of the Jewish nation. It's all building up to this confrontation with religious leaders, some kind of final battle. But Jesus looks around, and then he just leaves. It was late. He was tired. Uh, Where were the crowds? Did they go home? They missed Jesus. He went left. They went. This ending seems abrupt, but it sets the stage for the next day's cleansing of the temple in verses 15 to 19 and shows us that Jesus' true destination was the temple. But ironically, when he arrives, nothing happens. The crowd had vanished. Perhaps Mark is warning us against mistaking enthusiasm, hype, emotionalism for genuine faith. Genuine faith exists when the excitement has faded. We can sing and praise and shout for God's glory all we want here in church. And this is amazing. It's so great. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. I'm on the worship team. I know how important this is. But are we with Jesus in the temple, in the quiet moments? When the excitement fades, do you seek him in the silence and solitude of everyday life when the parade has moved on? Can we trust in God when things get difficult? Does your, pra- does your faith and praise fade or disappear when suffering happens? Or does it fade when the daily, sometimes mundane, repetitive, even boring work that needs to be done for the kingdom happens? Are you here for the music, the singing, the dancing, but nowhere to be seen when you need to serve? Jesus first quietly observed the temple state, intending to address its disorders later. This can help us to understand how God is aware of all the world's wickedness, but he is intentionally delaying his judgment. Can we trust God when things are going wrong? God sees every wicked thing and grieves with us over godly injustices. All things will be made right, but in God's time, not ours. Jesus is more compassionate than any human you will ever meet. He grieves with you in all your losses, but you need to praise and worship God even when life is not going your way, especially when life is not going your way. Instead of blaming or cursing God, let's run to Jesus for comfort and solace. He suffered far greater than you will ever have to. And he can comfort you in any moment of need. He understands your pain better than you do. The entire historical account of the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. Through the many sufferings and pains of biblical history, God used all things for his glory, for good, You may not understand. I know I don't. Most of Israel didn't understand when Jesus came to reveal God. It might be difficult at times, painful. You might be hurting right now. But God is in control. God has a plan better than you could ever imagine. Fifteen years ago, the love of my life, Inga, broke up with me. She dumped me, kicked me to the curve. Yeah. 
We'd only been dating for about a month, but I was devastated. I was heartbroken. I cried for years and years and never got over her. <laughs> now, 15 years later, we are married to each other. The preach meeting team told me to clarify that. It's a better story. We got married to each other. She's my wife. So we got married now. Woo! Yes. <laughs> And even more glorious than that, we both found Christ. I'm standing here today preaching the gospel, something I couldn't even imagine three years ago. I didn't get this at the time. I was in pain and I didn't understand, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Seeing where Inga and I are now, our life together, our marriage rooted in Christ at the center, I wouldn't change a single thing. Praise God. <laughs> you may never understand some things this side of eternity. And not understanding in itself can be painful. But God works all things for his glory, for good. You have to trust God to do the right thing in his time, not yours. As difficult as this can be, in moments of suffering, you're never alone in this. The body of Christ, the church, me and you, us together, we are called to encourage and support one another, to be there for each other. We have the Holy Spirit in us to strengthen and help us persevere through anything. We have Jesus to turn to for comfort, looking to our Savior, beholding Jesus' glory. And here we see how he looked to the cross. We can see that the true destination of the triumph triumphal entry was the temple but his inspection went unnoticed. Let's not make these same mistakes, ensuring we understand the nature of Jesus' mission, understanding that the temple visit paved the way for escalating confrontations with religious leaders, resulting in his ultimate sacrifice. The triumphant entry gives us insight into the true identity of Jesus. So just to recap tonight's sermon, we read through how intentionally Jesus prepared for his entrance into Jerusalem. We saw how the Old Testament adds greater depth to this account. We heard the crowd cry out, Hoshana, longing for a national deliverer, missing the deeper mission here. Jesus' mission was spiritual, not political. That Jesus, to redeem the whole creation, did not despise the cross. His entry into Jerusalem laid the groundwork for the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus is the one who died for humanity's sins, granting eternal salvation, to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost. This challenges us to understand the depth of his sacrificial love and the true nature of his kingdom. If you guys wanna join with me as I wrap up, you can just stand. We're gonna go straight into worship. So contrary to the view of Jesus as a helpless victim, he was fully in control of the events leading to his crucifixion, choosing the cross out of obedience to God and love for humanity. Even in his suffering, he saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake you died. Unlike Roman emperors of the time who demanded worship, or the world leaders of today who flaunt their power, from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt, Jesus embodying true humility entered Jerusalem on a donkey. This fulfilled Old Testament prophecies and contrasts worldly power with divine servanthood, which is sacrificial. It comes at a cost. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom, I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me. So in our hearts, in our actions, not just but words, let's all together praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. Praise forever to the King of Kings. Let's sing to Jesus. <laughs>